again, is a rendering, but I think we have some pictures that show this too, of how the car explodes into component modules. Now, this we didn't invent. We took it from object-oriented programming, or contract-first development. The idea is, when we started designing the car, when we started engineering the car, we didn't know exactly what the chassis would end up being like. We didn't know exactly what type of drivetrain we'd end up using. We didn't know what type of suspension we'd end up using. So what we wanted to do is reduce the cost to make change between those parts. So instead, we architected the contract. The way those modules would talk to each other and hold together in a structural way and the way they'd communicate. So before we'd even built a chassis, we were designing mount points and how they'd structurally connect to each other. And then we started iterating the modules that would connect. So we have this chassis this uh, very elemental geometric shape, the rectangle in the center made of extruded aluminum. It's the same type of aluminum extrusions Jaguar, Lotus, and Aston Martin use. Mm. Then we have our front crust structure that's replaceable, and in this rendering, that's version three of our front crust structure. That started as something that looks a lot more like a conventional automotive bumper. It looked a lot more like the crust structures mounted behind a conventional automotive bumper. We started there, validated its safety, and then iterated to see can we make something simpler, lighter, and less expensive, and validated its safety, and then iterated again. And by version three, we were down to multiple alloys of alum aluminum square tube. Those are tubes that we can order at 5 p.m. any day and have them delivered to our shop by 8 a.m. the next day, and we don't have to have uh, $100 million presses, and we don't have to have multi-tens of million dollar stamped steel dies to make these parts. We order stock parts from multiple suppliers and cut them to length. Then the suspension modules are two foot by two foot aluminum plates. On the car right here, you see McPherson strut suspension. That's ultimately what was fastest for the XPRIZE competition. And also it could be adjustable to be one of the more comfortable setups we tested. But we're able to change suspension tight now, on a high-end race car, you might be able to adjust the position of the suspension. You might be able to adjust camber, caster, uh, dampening, and rebound. In the wiki speed car, we can adjust the distance between the wheels in wheelbase and track, all the other measurements, and also uh, the ride height of the suspension, not just its preloaded compression. That's unheard of. We did something that's even new in race cars, and we were able to do it in a car that we could drive on the road. Again, modularity allowed it. So we have a front crust structure, a rear crust structure, the entire interior lifts out like a giant aluminum bathtub. Now it's like a carbon fiber bathtub. And it has a carbon fiber dash molded in. So people could have the L.L. Bean winter edition or the picnic summer edition and switch between the two. What that meant is we could change any part of the car without having to re-engineer the rest. And this is how we were able to compete in the XPRIZE against companies that were much better funded, much better resourced, and companies that had been in automotive, automotive development for a long time. The entire engine module rolls out of the back of the car in about the time it takes to change a tire. That's the engine, the transmission, the fuel system, the emission system, the fuel injection system. They all roll out together in about the time it takes to change a tire. So we could have one engine module being tested on a test bench, being paced through automated tests using test-driven development, and another engine module in the car out doing laps, pull the car in next to the engine module on the test bench, switch the two modules, and continue to test so we're able to rapidly iterate engine systems without building a new car. So if we decided we wanted to be, make a radical change in our drivetrain, we wouldn't have to rebuild our seatbelt anchors we wouldn't have to rebuild our braking system. We wouldn't even have to change our gauges or our gauge cluster. We simply swapped the engine module. Now that's the same as any of us would want when we buy a new phone these days. We want to be able to ins install different applications and radically change the functionality of the phone. We want to be able to put a different skin on the phone and change its look and feel. Right now we can't do that with cars, but Wikispeed has shown one way that we can, where we can start to catch up the second largest purchase most of us ever make, our car, right after our home for most of us. With everything else we buy now, like our phones, and able to increase customer realized visible value. Also, by loosely coupling the modules so that they're not dependent on each other, we can make changes in parallel. It's quite common during a Team WikiSpeed build party, every Thursday night we get together at various locations all over the world, 
and split the cars, we have multiple cars, into their component assemblies, their modules. That means we can have a pair of people working on the suspension system, a pair of people working on the emission system, a pair of people working on the braking system without getting in each other's way because these systems rapidly separate and they're loosely coupled. So we can make very significant changes between, any, between the systems without affecting the other. Imagine if on your next software project you uh, were tightly coupled to your database and then your customer says, no, we want it to be able to support MySQL, we want it to be able to, be able to support Oracle, we want it to be able to support Microsoft SQL Server. And you say, but well, we built it to just take one database. Well, that's how most cars are built. So we just adopted the present paradigm and applied it back to manufacturing. This is what the car looks like with a semi-transparent skin. So again, this is a rendering. You see how two seats nest in the car. We have two seat and four seat interiors. In the Progressive Insurance Automotive X Prize, we were in the mainstream class, meaning we had four adults in the car. And the two adults in the front had to be 95th percentile males, meaning they're only 5% of the population of America larger than them. So these are 250 pound, six foot two men in the front seat. And then 75th percentile males, so still well above average, two of them in the back seat. Here's the car with two seats in it, and these modules switch. This lets me start talking about safety. So you just saw how people sit in that chassis and how the chassis is positioned inside the body, underneath the aero shell, which also changes. Here is finite element analysis of how that car performs in various impact scenarios. Now, for United States road legal certification, we have to do a frontal collision test, a frontal offset collision test, a side impact test, a rear impact test, a roof crush test, a rollover test. Here are some of these tests. Team Wikispeed developed the lightest chassis currently known to achieve a five-star crash rating equivalency. Five stars is as high as crash rating gets from the NHTSA and the IIHS. Now, the NHTSA and IIHS haven't given us five stars yet. What they have done is publish their criteria, which we've met. So we have five-star crash equivalency. And here's how. The top left picture probably illustrates it the very best. We have this blue box smacking the side of our chassis. That blue box is the deformable barrier used in the side impact test. It's put on a 3,500, sorry, 5,500 pound rolling sled that hits the side of the car at 35 miles an hour. That's a medium duty work truck slamming into the side of the car at 35 miles an hour. That's a devastating test. This diagram has red coloring to show peak stress where the highest points of stress are across the chassis. If you'll see, there's some red on the complete opposite side of the chassis. Most vehicles, the side of the car has to be strong enough to withstand the entire impact of the side impact test, just the door structure, for example. In the Wiki Speed car, that load is shared across the entire chassis. Now, we didn't come up with that. Honda's been doing that in their Civic since 2006 as part of their ACE, or Advanced Compatibility Engineering Body Structure and other automotive manufacturers are keen on this as well. Honda does it in two dimensions. If an impact is devastating enough that it might be potentially fatal to the driver if they don't do something severe, the frontal impact will channel stress up through the A-pillars, down through the C-pillars, and start to deform the rear of the car. So they'll sacrifice a part of the car that wasn't even hit in order to save the passengers. Very savvy. The Wikispeed car does something similar in three dimensions by virtue of this simple, geometric shape. And it seems clear how a side impact would communicate load. It's also true in this car on offset frontal corner loading and roof crush. Again, on agile lean scrum teams, many of us are used to being dramatically quicker than the rest of the companies in the organization we're servicing. Here, we have the lightest chassis in the world to achieve a five-star crash rating that anybody knows about. There might be something in skunk works or in secret development that hasn't been uh, spoken about yet. But as far as is publicly known, we have the lightest, safest car in the world. Lean. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Using less stuff. So remember before the slide of the hydraulic press stamping out parts and it takes enough power to, to uh, run a small town? We use an $89 bandsaw. That, that, that's right, we use an $89 bandsaw. <laughs> We take these aluminum, aluminum extrusions 
and cut them to length. And then there's a CNC router on the table behind Rob Huggins there, where those, where those aluminum extrusions are placed once they're cut to length. The CNC router then cuts out the mount points and cuts out our suspension. While that's happening, we can work on wiring or interior or other aspects of the car. Then the car is kitted and it's almost completely done. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about reduce expensive tooling with tooling that where you have no money caught up in your existing design. The next Wikispeed car is the next design that's checked in. It's the next code version checked in of CAD. It's the next design that's ready to be machined. We don't have to wait 10 years to amortize expenses because we've invested in rapid prototyping technology. And it turns out that within the last 10 years, rapid prototyping has become so accurate, so cost effective, and so quick that we can scale to hundreds of thousands of cars and still come out cost ahead versus traditional stamped metal manufacturing when we consider the cost of even one change. By reducing tooling and inventory investment, we can responsibly change process each sprint. What that also means is that CNC router cost us $2,700 on Craigslist. We got it used and it was built from a kit. That bandsaw was on sale with a coupon. So <laughs> what that means <laughs> is if a new technology comes out next week, it's cost effective for us to take advantage of it because we're not tied up a significant amount of resources in our tooling. <laughs> From agile methodology, we take on the hallmark command, reduce cost to make change. By minimizing cost to make change, we innovate quickly. Those are changes in team, tooling, even goals. So when the lead aerodynamicist from GM's aerodynamics lab joined the team, when we met him at the North American International Auto Show, we wanted to take advantage of what he knew about aerodynamics right away. We didn't want to have to build a whole new car because the body of the car lifts off. We could design just a new car body that had enhanced aerodynamics with his expertise and put it on the existing mechanicals and retest. We didn't have to build a new car. So that's an example of changes in team. Changes in goals. The X Prize was the first car to get 100 miles per gallon city and highway and meet road legal spec would get $10 million. And then they said, what if people don't think it happened? What if people don't think a car actually could achieve 100 miles per gallon? They said, let's make it a media spectacle. Let's make it a race. Any car that thinks it can get 100 miles per gallon will verify it. And if more than one car can, we'll put them in a race together and the fastest car wins. But they didn't tell us how they were going to measure fastest. First, they said it was going to be a road course in downtown Manhattan, New York City, United States. And this is an international competition, but they thought this is a population-dense center where so many people would see it happen, it would be impossible to say it never happened. And it was going to be these long straightaways and these tighter than 90 degree hairpins, and then these long straightaways. Now to be competitive in a race format and even attempt more than 100 miles per gallon requires a very specific type of suspension and fuel economy system. Contestants started engineering their cars towards those goals. Then the XPRIZE said it's actually going to be a cross-country rally. It will go from New York City to uh, Los Angeles across the breadth of the United States. <coughs> That's a very different type of suspension and drivetrain to uh, try to be race competitive at 100 miles per gallon. Companies started rebuilding their cars or building new cars. We changed our suspension modules. Then they said it's actually going to be at Laguna Seca in California. Now, for the car nuts in the room, Laguna Seca is a racetrack, and it has this turn called the corkscrew. You're driving up, and it looks like a mountain. And you're headed up at such an extreme angle, you don't see the track over the horizon, so it looks like you're just taking off into space. As you hit the top of this mountain, there's a tight left turn, very tight. And then you go downhill and turn right with no loading. That takes a very specific suspension type just to not break the car. Cars are particularly engineered to survive Laguna Seca's corkscrew, much less try to compete on it quickly. Other contestants started to withdraw their cars from the competition because they had already rebuilt their cars multiple times. We had rated our suspension system. Scrum gives us the core roles and responsibilities to have a highly functional, agile team. 
what we discovered from Scrum, from this lean implementation of agile problem solving and an agile team, was that team morale is a multiplier for velocity. There are other supporting studies across the two years, two and a half years that Team Wikispeed has been in operation. We've seen this uh, to be exceptionally true. Team morale isn't just plus plus for velocity. It isn't just minus minus if you're not happy. It's actually a multiplier. This was the key reason why we were able to build a prototype that achieved 100 miles per gallon in three months, keeping team morale high. And that wasn't an accident, and it wasn't because we had nice people in team, although we do. It's because the methodology enforces proper practice to keep team morale high. It's because there are practices built into the Scrum and Agile toolbox that keep team morale high, like not having unnecessary meetings, like pairing, like swarming. By using the process properly, we kept morale paved high and we iterated more quickly than we've ever seen an automotive company iterate. From extreme programming, we get pairing and swarming. Here's Kurt Roy and Martin Val putting together one of our engines doing final long block assembly. They both know how to do this operation, but at one time only one of them did. Let's say only Martin Val knew how to attach the transmission to the car in a safe way. By the end of this pairing session, not only are they both going faster because multiple, many hands make light work of this task, but they both have done it before. Now, as I mentioned, they've both pulled and swapped and changed engines many times. But through extreme programming, we have knowledge transfer without additional overhead. We don't take anyone offline to train them. And by the end of that build party, we have multiple people who know that task. Uh, a better example, even, is our milling machine. Many of us have never used a milling machine. It's like a drill press. You pull it down and a bit comes down and it machines sideways in metal and other materials. We have team members that founded the material science lab at MIT. We have team members from Bridgestone Tire and Continental Tire. We have team members who ran the largest military research facility in the world. We have team members who did electrical engineering and mechanical engineering at NASA, Apple Computer, and the US Air Force. And we have a whole lot of team members who care about Team Wikispeed for environmental reasons, but they've never changed their own oil. We have housewives and house husbands. We have high school science teachers, and we have high school kids. We need to be able to take advantage of the most skill out of each and every team member in just one day. So when a team member walks into the room, we use the Agile framework, framework to reduce cost to make change in team, where we say, here's the safety shelf. All safety equipment you need is here. Here's the snack shelf equally important. Here's the milling machine, and we don't say any more about the milling machine, just here it is. Here's this thing, it's called the milling machine. Here's the CNC router, here's the band saw, here's the power hack saw. Here's the one shelf with all the power tools, here's the one shelf with all the hand tools. They've had their orientation, and then we say, here's the backlog, please pick the thing that's highest to the top left that you know how to use, that you know how to build, or that you want to learn about. And if it's something they want to learn about, they'll take the sticky off and we'll say, who here knows about this to form a pair? They'll make a pair together, the experienced person and the new person, and by the end of that session, they both know, at least on an elementary level, how to complete all of those tasks. And because they did it in front of everyone else in a scrum room, within eyesight and earshot of everyone else, everyone else got to see some idea of what was going on. So say that new team member comes in and they don't use the milling machine. They've been introduced, they've been told this is a milling machine, and they go off and do another task. Well, another pair will be working the milling machine. And every tool to use and maintain the milling machine is out and visible next to the milling machine. So by the end of that day, that new person has seen a milling machine, they know it's called a milling machine, they've seen every tool to run it, they've seen every tool to maintain it, and out of their corner of their eye, they've seen it used and maintained. We didn't take any extra time to train them. By the start of the next session, they're ready to be in a pair and use the milling machine with someone more experienced. And by the third session, they're able to lead a pair on the milling machine, and again, with no time taken for training. This we get from extreme programming, and we use within Team Wikispeed. Then swarming, when you're in one large scrum room, now we're in multiple scrum rooms, but we use video chat and we leave a conference call open, we, it's easy to see when a pair becomes blocked. Their body posture changes, their body language changes, and their voice changes. The team then swarms to rapidly solve that problem. And as ridiculous as this sounds, 
Even when we're doing something that had never been done before, we never hit a block we weren't able to bulldoze with a swarm. It's not that we've done this before, it's not that anyone had done this before, it's that swarming is very effective. When you have that many team members focusing on one issue for a moment, there's an enormous amount of intensity and human creativity, and it unblocks problems quickly. Something we found out to help keep morale high is having three of every tool. Now, a traditional extreme programming pairing station is two monitors, two keyboards, two mice, and one computer. So there's one development session open, and they're both typing in the same session. We would recommend having a third empty hoteling station, and here's why. In Team Wiki Speed, we, if we would have three wrenches of every size. We would have three of every tool, so that both members of the pair can be using it, and so that when we have a swarm, someone can say, I might be able to help, and they can pick up that third tool and help. That's because if we only have two, and a team member walks in and says, well, here, give me that wrench. Let me show you how it's done which they'd be tempted to do, but they're excited, they've just solved this tough problem. That actually dips morale. We're able to boost morale when no one takes anything from anybody and we all pitch in. Which is why I would recommend, if we could afford it, three monitors, three keyboards, three mice, one CPU for extreme programming. So some of what we learned in Team Wikispeed, I now get to apply back to my day job, Agilene Scrum Consulting. Um, by working in a collaborative shared space, we unblock it quickly. From Kanban, we enforce work in process limits and sprintless releases. We also use stubs and iterations to have constant successes. Here's one of our Kanban boards from one of our Michigan facilities, or our splint planning boards. We have backlog in progress, um, ready for review, and done. In this case, it goes straight to done because we have the product owner embedded in the team during all of those times. And this is a a task board in an automotive shop. And the tasks say things like, as a user, I can achieve 100 miles per gallon on the EPA city driving cycle. The work in process limits, if you notice, there are two tasks in progress. That evening, we had four people in the shop. That meant we had two pairs. We wanted to avoid context switching loss at all costs, and that's what Kanban gives us. Say someone is grinding aluminum. They have an aluminum grinder on, so they have a face shield on, they have ear protection, they have a dust mask, and they have an apron and gloves, and they're grinding aluminum. And say, I say, hey, can you help me take the suspension modules off so we can iterate this system? They would say, sure. They'd stop the grinder, they'd take off the hearing protection, they'd take off the face shield, they'd take off the dust mask, they'd take off the apron, they'd vacuum their area of all the shaped aluminum chips, they'd put everything away, and then they'd come help me. Then they would put all that back on to resume their task. That's exactly what Kanban wants to avoid, is context switching loss. What we do instead is say, if there's two pairs in shop tonight, we would have a number two over the in-progress column, and say there should only be two tasks in progress to avoid context switching loss. That means people are able to finish their tasks, which keeps morale high. So notice, every single one of these tasks, when wielded in a certain way, keeps morale high. And that seems to be the entire secret sauce for rapid velocity. Now, iterations and stubs, we used test-driven development. So we started, before we even built a car, with a list of red lights on the wall. And those were all tied to a test. They were tests like, as a user, I can achieve 100 miles per gallon on the EPA city cycle. As a user, I can uh, survive a crash test of a frontal impact with a five-star equivalency. Seatbelt anchors achieving UDDS uh, land vehicle specification. Specs about the turn signals and their visibility and their brightness and lumens. That we have an air conditioning and as a user I can keep the cockpit temperature always lower than 80 degrees Fahrenheit even when it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Etc, etc, etc. And those were all red lights. What that meant is we're able to be very lean about how we spent our time. If anyone was doing work, because we were in a competition to do something that had never been done before, we needed to be very lean with our time, very responsible with what we were focused on building. If any team member was doing work that wasn't directly linked to turning one of those red lights green, we were able to quickly get that time back and repurpose them to do work that would turn one of those red lights green. When any team member did work that turned a light green, we were able to see if it turned any other lights red, because we built regression tests first just like a software team would when using test-driven development. We would use unit tests and regression tests. 
what that also meant is since we were working in scrum rooms, every time the light turned green, everybody could get excited. Everybody could share that success. Everybody could high five, even if they weren't the pair that turned that light green. It's infectious. And that meant that uh, when we didn't know how a system would be solved, we could use stubs and iterations and they'd be visible across the team. An example, our parking brake handle. We knew we would want a lever to activate the parking brake. We didn't do it yet. It wasn't high in priority order in our backlog, not compared to things like in reducing our emissions and increasing our fuel economy and increasing our safety. We knew it would be a lever. It wouldn't be hard. We just hadn't done it yet. What we found is that began to slow down velocity because in the area of where the lever would go, people didn't want to do work. People didn't want to put their system around this thing because they were afraid it was going to change soon, and, and it probably would when we started putting the lever in. So work there became a sneak pit in software terms, an area where people didn't want to touch, and it started to affect the velocity of other work. So what we did is we put a cardboard box there and said, we don't know what this lever is going to be yet, but we know it won't be bigger than this cardboard box. So you can build as close to this cardboard box as you want, and velocity went back up. In fact, people celebrated there being V0.1 of the handbrake because we had a cardboard box there. That was exciting to the team. And then when we replaced it with a wood thing that wasn't very durable but actually allowed us to activate and test the parking brake, that was a high five again across the team and then an aluminum handbrake, and then a carbon fiber composite handbrake. So we got to celebrate that module five times before we were even iterating to make it more awesome. We communicate using tools that didn't exist 10 years ago for the most part. Also, interestingly about these tools, many of them are from companies that never had a business plan. Many of them are from companies that were never predictive about what their revenue stream would be, they were just focused on creating customer visible value. Now, not all of them, but many of these companies, that was their modus operandi, was how do we make something valuable to people? We'll find a way to capitalize on it later. These tools don't replace the value of a dedicated, collaborative, co-located team, but they make it less painful to be a distributed, collaborative team. We have team members that have day jobs. We have team members that have twins. We have team members that are involved in rugby club. We have team members that have other activities that are important to them, so we get them part-time. And we need to make sure that when we have them, we have the most value out of them. These tools enable us to do that across time zones with surprising efficiency. Google Docs, for example, allows us to edit a document that we'll be sharing with, say, uh, micro-investors or a grant application. And we can have one of our team members in South Africa and his cursor will say Ufandi Chimizu uh, moving around the, the screen as he edits the doc. And then there'll be me, a little Joe Justice, as I edit around the doc. And then we'll have a conference bridge open as we edit that collaboratively. Now that conference bridge will be provided by freeconferencecall.com. That's a free service. In fact, all of these pieces of software are free. Now, if we had the budget, there are some very powerful Agile, Lean, and Scrum tools for distributed collaborative teams, many of which they're going to have uh, spoken about in many sessions across this, this uh, week, this, this seminar. These are available to teams starting out and even teams that have scaled to the hundreds of team members. We use Dropbox to share large files like our CAD. We use Microsoft Windows Live SkyDrive to share large files like our CAD. We use YouTube to share demos and, in some cases, excerpts from Team Stand Up. We use Facebook to share team status because it doesn't just communicate across the team, it also communicates across to other people who might be interested in joining the team and say, well, I've got two hours on a Thursday night. I'd love to support via email. Or, you know what? My cousin has an empty garage space. I want a Wikispeed chassis in there, and I'll start iterating over there with my uh, Boy Scouts club or our Girl Scouts club or our church, or our various organizations. Then we use Google Groups to stay in touch through, uh, through our email list, which is the core of our collaboration. And we use an email list a lot like a scrum room. If someone writes me an email directly, I'll reply all and say, yeah, we should meet up at this time. So suddenly the entire team knows that I'll be in the shop uh, Saturday at 1 p.m. Pacific. And so they might say, oh, well, I was going to do this on Sunday, but I know more team members will be there all come Saturday. It's the same value of a scrum room. It's a conversation that might not directly apply to us, but it's continually giving us more information to be aware of. So people skim through the email list. There's 50 to 150 emails a day.
but people will skim the subject lines and say, oh, I'm interested in that, I'll read that, I'll reply. And so we reply all, and that's all done for free using Google Groups. We also use LinkedIn as our <coughs> professional networking tool. So when someone joins the team and says, how can I help? We can look at their LinkedIn profile if they've populated one to say, oh, well, they've done this, this, and this before. We might be able to get highest use with them if we engage them in these ways. A probable future is that Agile, Lean, and Scrum are going to become more steeped in all industries. I've personally been on Agile, Lean, or Scrum teams in all of these verticals. Insurance, financial, manufacturing, entertainment, energy, government, state, local, and federal, and healthcare, and not all in software projects. We're on the verge of a manufacturing revolution because on the manufacturing side, we now have CNC, or computer numerically controlled machines, that are able to replace large, very expensive machines for less than $10,000. That means we have, finally, mass personalization replacing uh, mass single design. And we have mass customization. And that's been enabled by tools that were prohibitively expensive 10 years ago and have just come down to personal affordability level in the last three years. Now we have digital tools to enable collaborative teams and to enable Agile, Lean, and Scrum across larger distances and to make them focus teams across any vertical. A probable future is that all of these industries are going to need people who know how to do Agile, Lean, and Scrum well. They're going to need process coaches. They're going to need Scrum masters. They're going to need experienced Agile and Scrum teams in software development and outside software development. If that were to happen, companies would be able to deliver products that weren't specified three years before they ever see a customer, but one version of them one week before they ever see a customer, and then change their mind again one week before they reach a customer, and then change their mind again one week before they reach a customer, meaning it'll take them a lot less time to develop customer visible value, and it'll take them a lot less time to make financial return on their investments, and their investments will be smaller. So that means companies will start having more free time. That means Agilene and Scrum teams might have team members that start having more free time. And what would we do if we had a little bit more free time? I'd encourage you to think about spending some of your time rapidly solving problems for social good. Team WikiSpeed doesn't just do cars. We do vaccine delivery. We do bipedal robotics walking systems. We do uh, remote clinic deployments for the developing world, making um, clinics and medical systems that don't require specialized training to use. We do microfinancing for the underprivileged uh, uh, developing countries and, and microinvestment opportunities for countries that didn't have them before. We care about all these things because we think those things are part of what would make a better world that we would really, really, really like to live in. I'd encourage you to think about doing some of that. Now, I'm an automotive nerd. I'm a process nerd and I'm an efficiency nerd but maybe one of you is a refrigeration nerd. Rotavirus kills millions of children a year, most of them in the developing world, and there is a vaccine, but that big vaccine requires refrigeration. So the people who need it most, that vaccine is delivered, the last leg, it's being carried by hand. There aren't even jeep roads to access the areas where the most children die of rotavirus each year. If one of you were a refrigeration nerd, you might be able to develop a chemical pack refrigerant that fits in something like a Federal Express triangular package envelope that would allow a higher percentage of that vaccine to reach its useful end destinations. If one of you were using Agile, Lean, and Scrum, you might be able to do that very quickly. In Team WikiSpeed, we were able to, nights and weekends, build a 100 mile per gallon car. The version of it we raced in the XPRIZE was built in three months. In the time it would take you to watch a season of Big Brother, you might be able to develop that refrigeration system and potentially save millions of lives. Or you might be able to develop version one, a proof of concept, and then attract more interested people to make a version two. And by version three, you might have saved millions of lives. And in the time you would have spent watching 
one season of network television. Which might be more important? Which would you be happier about in your life? Which really adds more value to the planet and the world we're living in? One of you might be a mobile application expert with some financial services interest. Nigerian diaspora in sub-Saharan Africa don't have banks. They don't have investment opportunities. That's a privilege for first world countries. They do have cell phones with data plans. Currently, they either keep their money on their person or hide it in their homes as they go out to work the fields and hope it's there when they come home. In the time it would take one of you to get caught up on the East Enders, you could have developed version one of a mobile banking application to radically change these people's lives and level in a way the playing field of investment opportunities between the first world and the third world. I'd encourage you to do that. You're welcome to do all of those as parts of Team Wikispeed. You would email info at wikispeed.com. That's my email. It sounds generic, but that's actually me, Joe Justice. And join the team from any part of the world. But you don't have to, to radically solve problems for social good. And if everyone in this room spent even two hours a week, maybe you stopped watching TV or stopped watching one sport and still watched the rest of the sports. You know, we toned it down somewhere. And spent that time instead taking on a complex problem for social good. If you used Agile, Lean, and Scrum, you would have a high likelihood of actually being successful with that tricky problem. And if everyone in this world did, it would be so awesome. It would be like Mega Shark high-fiving King Kong in front of an explosion. Thank you. I'm Joe Justice with Team Wikispeed.